friends, and welcome to the 2024 Arrow Lecture on Ethics and Leadership. I'm Leif Winar, a professor of philosophy and the faculty director of the McCoy Family Center on Ethics and Society, which is the sponsor of the Arrow Lecture series. Tonight's lecture by Professor Raj Chetty is also co-sponsored by the Graduate School of Business here at Stanford, as well as the Stanford Department of Economics. The Arrow Lectures were created in 2005 and have become among the most prestigious lectures at the university. Previous Arrow Lecturers have included distinguished social scientists and philosophers, including Anthony Atkinson, Jonathan Glover, Jeffrey Sachs, Paul Collier, Danny Roderick, Robert Reich, Thomas Piketty, Tyler Cowan, and Nobel Prize winners Esther Duflo and Amartya Sen. And speaking of Nobel Prize winners, the Arrow Lectures are named in honor of our late colleague, Kenneth Arrow, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, and one whose work remained true to Adam Smith's idea of economics as fundamentally a moral science. Ken was the youngest recipient of the Nobel Prize in economics when he won it in 1972 for his contributions to general equilibrium theory. Had it been allowed, Ken might have won another Nobel for his contributions to social choice theory, particularly his proof of the arrow impossibility theorem. And he might have won another Nobel still had it been allowed for his work on uncertainty and risk which he applied broadly to policy in healthcare. Perhaps most remarkably of all, five of Ken Arrow's students went on to win the Nobel Prize, more evidence of his immense influence on the field. With that introduction, and without wanting to jinx anything that may well happen in the future, I am delighted to welcome Professor Raj Chetty to present this year's Arrow Lecture. Professor Chetty is our finest analyst of the economics of the American dream. His work on social mobility, on the effects of racial and regional inequalities, on the family structure and education and housing, and on social capital and innovation will be known to all of us, whether from the front page of the New York Times or from its real impacts on American policy at all levels. The breadth of Professor Chetty's research is matched by the precision that comes from his innovative use of big data. And his passion for evidence-based solutions is embedded in Opportunity Insights, a platform of data and policies designed to help more people to take advantage of their opportunities and so to realize the American dream. Professor Chetty is the recipient of the John Biggs Clark Medal and a MacArthur Genius Fellowship, and he currently holds the William A. Ackman Professorship of Economics at Harvard. In conversation with Professor Chetty tonight is David Gruskin, who is Edward Ames Edmonds Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences here at Stanford, as well as being Professor of Sociology, a Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, director of the Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality, and a co-editor of Pathways Magazine. Professor Grusky is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a co-recipient of the Max Weber Award, and the founder of the Cornell University Center on the Study of Inequality. His recent books include The Great Recession, The New Gilded Age, Occupy the Future, social stratification, and inequality in the 21st century. Our format tonight is that Professor Chetty will present for around 25 minutes, after which he'll be in conversation with Professor Grusky for 20 minutes, and then we'll have half hour for questions from the audience. A reception will follow afterwards, to which you're all invited. And let me remind us that this event is being recorded and will be publicly available. No personal photography or recording is allowed. Looking at Professor Chetty's 
social capital data set, I noticed that zip code 94305 rates especially high on civic engagement. <laughs> so perhaps we might show that same hearty civic spirit in welcoming Raj Chetty back to Stanford as our 2024 Arrow Lecturer. Thanks so much, Lee, for the very warm introduction. It's really a pleasure to be back uh, here at Stanford and a special privilege for me to give the Arrow Lecture. Uh, above my desk, I have a few photographs of people I look to for inspiration. One of them is Ken Arrow, and so in a very literal sense, I look up to Ken Arrow every day uh, as, I, as I do my work. I want to start today's lecture by talking about a map that has occupied by my mind for the past 10 years, something that I think a number of you might have seen, but others may not have. And so let me start by describing what this map shows. It shows you the geography of economic opportunity in America and talk about how it sets the stage for what I'd like to discuss in some new work today. So what this map uh, illustrates is how children's chances of rising up and achieving the American dream, so to speak, vary across the United States. Let me tell you first how we construct this map and then what I think we learn from it. So what we do here in a study we put out 10 years ago is use data drawn from anonymized tax records covering 20 million kids, essentially all kids born in the late 1970s, early 1980s in the United States. We link them back to their parents and back to the place in which they grew up. And in each of 740 different metro and rural areas in the United States, we construct a very simple measure of upward mobility. We ask, what is the average household income at age 35 for kids who grew up in low-income families, which for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to define as families making $27,000 a year, which puts you at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution. So for example, in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can see that if you look at the income tax filings of kids who grew up in families making $27,000 a year, one generation later, when they were around age 35, they were making on average about $37,200 a year. You can similarly construct those statistics for all the other areas of the United States, and we color the map so that red-orange colors represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility, and blue-green colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility. If you start by looking at the scale in the lower right-hand side of this map, you can see that there's an enormous amount of variation in children's chances of rising up across different parts of the United States. There are some places like Dubuque, Iowa, and much of the central uh, Midwest where kids growing up in families making $27,000 a year on average are making $50,000 or more one generation later, quite a bit of upward mobility in a single generation. Yet there are other places like Charlotte, North Carolina, where kids starting out in families at that exact same income level one generation later are actually making less than their parents were on average, which is kind of remarkable when you think about it, given the amount of economic growth that has occurred in the United States over the past 30, 35 years. So you can see the broad regional patterns in this map for yourself and how you know, the rural Midwest has much higher levels of mobility than cities in the industrial Midwest, like Cleveland and Detroit, or the Southeast. This map has been a useful lens for us from a scientific perspective in understanding what drives the variation in upward mobility across areas. And it's also animated a lot of interest in policy circles in trying to understand how we might increase mobility going forward. So to give you one example, I pointed out Charlotte earlier as a place with particularly low levels of economic mobility. It turns out if you look at the 50 largest cities in America, Charlotte ranks 50th out of 50 in terms of rates of upward mobility. Now, when we put out these data 10 years ago, people in Charlotte recognized that fact, and there was a lot of consternation and discussion about why Charlotte, despite being a thriving city by conventional measures, lots of job growth, higher incomes on average, and so on, still was not a land of opportunity. It was a place where kids, as we saw here, you know, growing up in low-income families, didn't have great chances of succeeding. And that led to a lot of discussion in Charlotte. You can see the local basketball team here having a special night to raise awareness of economic mobility. There were hundreds of millions of dollars spent by nonprofits and changes in hiring practices at businesses and so on with the intention of trying to change uh, 
economic opportunity in Charlotte and countless other similar initiatives across the United States that our team is engaged in with uh, folks in policy circles. At the same time, while we were doing that, I was following the academic literature that was developing on these topics, using the data that we had put out publicly to try to understand what drives these differences in economic mobility. And some of the findings from that work gave me pause in thinking about whether these efforts to change opportunity could really be successful. Let me give you a couple of examples. Here's a nice study done by a demographer named Berger in a, in, published in Demography in 2018 that takes our data, the map that I just showed you on the first slide on the right, and compares it to rates of slavery in 1860. And you can see that there's a striking resemblance between the prevalence of slavery in 1860 and where you see the lowest levels of upward mobility in present day United States. And so that kind of relationship you know, makes you wonder, is it factors that emerged 150 years ago or institutions and uh, you know, policies perhaps from 150 years ago that are casting a long shadow and making it uh, limiting opportunity today? Here's another example in the same vein. Here's a study done of comparing redlining boundaries, so discriminatory credit practices across neighborhood lines, often correlated with race, showing you which places were redlined and denied credit here in the Bay Area back in the 1930s, comparing that with census tract level data from our modern Opportunity Atlas using the tax records by census tract today in the Bay Area. And once again, you can see it's precisely the places that were redlined where access to credit that was, was denied, where you know, 80 years later, we're seeing the lowest levels of economic mobility. So these kinds of facts you know, made me wonder, is it sort of a fool's errand to try to change opportunity through these interventions? You know, are these things determined by factors that are, uh, occurred so long ago that it's going to be very difficult to change things in short horizons? It's more from a personal perspective, as someone who's devoted my time to studying this issue, you know, is it really going to be feasible to see changes on these questions in my own lifetime? Or is this something that evolves over a 150, 200 year time scale? And so with that motivation, I want to talk today about some new work we're doing on our team, which we're going to put out publicly in a couple of months, on changing opportunity. So this is a collaborative work with my colleagues Will Doby and Crystal Yang uh, at Harvard, as well as Benny Goldman, who's a graduate student at Harvard, and Sonia Porter at the Census Bureau. And what we're doing in uh, this work is taking advantage of newly available data, essentially because 10 years have elapsed since we did that study in 2014. We have 10 more years of tax data and can look at 10 more cohorts, essentially. And so what we're going to do is analyze changes in outcomes, changes in levels of economic mobility, for kids born between 1978 and 1992. So why do we focus on kids born between uh, 78 and 92? Basically, 1978, given currently available data, is the furthest back that you can go. And you need kids to be old enough to measure their incomes as adults in a reliable way. And we found that if you try to go much before age 27, you can't really get a very reliable measure of permanent income. So we're going to measure children's incomes from 2005 to 2019, which is going to be the last year of data that we use here, right before the pandemic. Uh, and that's why we focus on that cohort range. And so these data are, are going to give us the first look at how economic opportunity can change within a place and thereby allow us to understand better, I think, the mechanisms that may underlie changes in economic opportunity, which is what I think is really of fundamental interest from a policy perspective. So let me dive right into the data, and I'm happy to talk more about methodological details when we get to questions if anyone's interested, but I'm just going to summarize the, the key points here. So I'm going to start by showing you once again a map similar to what I started out with, but here I'm going to focus specifically on kids born in 1978, and specifically children who are white um, and born to low-income parents, again at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution. That map looks very similar to the map that I started out with. You see the lowest levels of economic mobility in the Southeast, the industrial Midwest, and so on. So now, let's look at what's happened over the past 15 years and reproduce this map for the 1992 birth cohort. What you can see is that those red colors, we're keeping the color scale fixed here, those red colors have basically spread 
across the United States. California, the Bay Area in particular, used to be a pretty good place in terms of your chances of rising up. If you were a low-income white kid, it's no longer so. You can see that rates of economic mobility, upward mobility in California, look just about like they do in the rural south at this point. Same thing goes in the Northeast and so on. So those red colors basically seem to spread. Economic mobility is falling for low-income white Americans. In contrast, if you now replicate the same map for black Americans, and I'm going to change the color scale here for a reason that will become evident in a second. Here, purple colors are places with the lowest levels of upward mobility, where you see the poorest outcomes for black kids. And the peach orange colors are the places that back in the 1978 cohort had the highest levels of upward mobility for black kids. So a lot of the map is empty here because you don't have significant black populations in many parts of the US. But you can see you know, this is what the pattern looked like in 1978. Now let's redo that analysis in 1992. And you can see in exact contrast with what you saw for white Americans, for black Americans over the past 15 years, outcomes have improved significantly across the United States. Those purple colors, places like Louisiana, for example, or parts of the rural south where you had really poor outcomes are now looking a bit better in terms of how black children are doing in more recent cohorts. Now, one thing I want to make very clear, and I will come back to this, is the reason we're using two different color scales is that if you now overlay what the color scale was that I showed you for the map for white Americans, there's still, even in the 1992 birth cohort, an enormous difference in outcomes for black kids versus white kids growing up in low-income families. That is to say, the very best places for black kids in the 1992 birth cohort, even after these improvements have occurred, they are having average incomes of about $37,000 a year. That's considerably lower than the places with the lowest levels of economic mobility for white children of $45,000 a year. So race continues to play an enormously important role in shaping economic mobility in America. But those gaps are changing over time, and they're changing differentially by race over time. So let's summarize the magnitudes of those changes by race and class a little bit more systematically using this table here. So I'm going to divide the data in two axes throughout this talk by race, and I'm going to focus specifically on black and white kids. Happy to talk more about what's happening with other groups. Basically, in a nutshell, we're not seeing significant changes for Hispanic folks, Asian folks, or Native Americans over the past 15 years, which is why I'm focusing on blacks versus whites. Um, and then I'm going to cut the data by class. Low income, 25th percentile. High income, 75th percentile. All right, so let's start look by just summarizing how average income changes for black children growing up in low-income families. Between 1978 and 1992, when you measure their incomes at age 27, average incomes rise by $1,400. That's relative to a mean income at that age of around $30,000. So think about this as you know, on the order of something like a 6% increase or something like that when you're 27 years old. So that's the black kids doing better, like we saw in that second pair of maps that I showed you. Conversely, white kids growing up in low-income families have deteriorating outcomes. Their incomes are falling by $2,000 on average in the United States across these birth cohorts. And when you put these two things together, you get a shrinking race gap. If you look at the gap in outcomes for black and white kids born to parents at the 25th percentile, Back in the 1978 cohort, that disparity was about $13,000, and it fell by the end of the period we're studying to about $9,500, about a 27% reduction in the black-white gap. Now, you know, over a 15-year period, I think a 30% you know, change in racial disparities is actually quite remarkable relative to the backdrop of the historical factors that I think shape some of these disparities, showing that change can actually occur over relatively short time horizons of a decade or something like that. Now, uh, on the other axis here, if we now look at white kids born to high-income parents at the 75th percentile, this I did not show you in the previous maps, which were focused on low-income folks. For white kids born to high-income parents at the same time, their incomes went up on average by $770. Okay, so what you're basically seeing is 
class is becoming a more important determinant of your outcomes among white children. There's a bigger disparity between uh, white kids born to low versus high income parents. And so that gap, we're gonna call that the class gap among white children, that gap started out at $10,000, and now it's grown to $13,000. So you see this growing class gap and shrinking race gap, uh, as you see from these first three numbers. And then finally, if you look at, you know, complete this box and you look at black kids born to high income parents, their incomes are going up by about $1,000. So essentially to summarize, what's happened in the past 15 years is that for black Americans across the income distribution, incomes have increased, outcomes have improved. For white Americans, there's basically a tilting of the profile where it now matters more if you're born to low versus high income parents, with white kids born to low income parents doing worse, white kids born to high income parents doing better. So what I wanna do in uh, the rest of this talk is having summarized these broad national trends, focus on what drove those trends from the perspective of trying to understand the mechanisms underlying changes in economic mobility more broadly. I basically want to use this as a lens to study the determinants of changes in mobility rather than differences across places in mobility, which is what the prior literature has focused on. So we, in the course of this project, investigated a number of different uh, mechanisms. We had a number of hypotheses, many of which, you know, for a couple of years, systematically proved to be rejected by the data. And I'm going to walk you through some that we found did not seem to matter, and then show you what I think seems to be a pretty clear explanation of the patterns. So one set of hypotheses which might come to mind, uh, and you know, which certainly we thought could be plausible, is that changes in family level factors, so for instance, changes in marital status or levels of education or levels of wealth, there have been significant trends in the United States and all of these things differentially by race and class in the past decades. You know, maybe some of these family level characteristics are explaining the changes that I've been showing you. Turns out that is absolutely not what's going on. You can look at kids growing up in families that, you know, with the same characteristics, two parent families, same levels of wealth, homeowners, same levels of education, and so on. You get exactly the same sorts of divergent trends, growing class gaps, shrinking race gaps that I showed you. Another plausible hypothesis, maybe this is about differences in what's happening in different places in the United States. So as we saw in those maps, black Americans tend to live in certain parts of the US, white Americans are spread across other regions. If there are different shocks hitting different places, you know, due to global competition, changes in manufacturing, the decline in manufacturing, et cetera, maybe that's what's creating differential changes. Again, a hypothesis I think soundly rejected by the data, if you compare two kids living in exactly the same census tract and, you know, look at the same trends over time, so take a black child and a white child growing up in exactly the same neighborhood, you continue to see these divergent trends uh, emerge. So that's not what's driving it. So what we conclude from those initial analyses is that these changes must be driven by differential trends by race and class, holding fixed these family characteristics within areas. So we then started to wonder, okay, what could such factors be? And we were inspired by the sociological literature, in particular the work of William Julius Wilson, my colleague at Harvard, and, and various others who followed in this vein, who argued based on ethnographic work, in the case of Wilson, ethnographic work done on the south side of Chicago, where to read a quote from his paper that you know, captures the key idea from his famous book in 1996, many of today's problems, crime, family dissolution, welfare, low levels of social organization, and so on, are fundamentally a consequence of the disappearance of work. So that's a very specific hypothesis for what might generate some of these changes. So taking that hypothesis at face value, we decided to go back to the data and investigate whether this seems to matter in practice. And so what we did is relate the changes in economic mobility by county, race, and class, the data that I was showing you on the maps just a few slides ago, to changes in parental employment rates for the exact same set of birth cohorts. So on the y-axis here is the data from the maps. Here I'm focusing first on white kids growing up in low-income families and these orange dots here. And I'm plotting that against changes in county-level parental employment rates. 
for the same cohort range, right? So how did parental employment rates change for the kids in the 1992 cohort versus the 1978 cohort, looking at their parents in that county among low-income white folks, okay? And what you can see here is this is a bin scatter plot. We're dividing the data into 20 equal-sized bins. Behind this is county-level uh, observations, and so each dot here represents 5% of the data binned by the x-axis variable. And what you can see, you know, the, the key point is that there's a clear relationship between these two variables. In the places where employment rates uh, fell the most for parents, we see the biggest reductions in percentile terms here for uh, white kids in terms of their earnings in adulthood. In the places where employment fell the least, you know, for example, if you look at the dot on the far right, those are the few places where you saw hardly any reduction in economic mobility for low-income white kids. So that series was for low-income white children. Now let's repeat that for black kids born to low-income parents. And you can see, again, the same relationship within that subgroup. It's just that everything is shifted over to the right, where levels of employment, parental employment, fell less across cohorts for black children than for white children, and correspondingly, mobility fell less as well. And then finally, if we look at high-income white parents, we see once again the same relationship. And so if you look across these three groups, you can basically fit a single line to these data, to put it in terms economists might use, a, a one-factor model, a single variable, fully explains the patterns that you see in the data, changes in parental employment consistent with Wilson's hypothesis based on the ethnographic work in Chicago, do in fact seem to almost perfectly explain the changes that we see across these groups, across areas, which I think is kind of remarkable. You know, usually it's very hard to find any one variable that explains these kinds of trends. That holds very strongly in, in these data. Now, one thing I want to emphasize in interpreting this correlation is that it's not just that if your own parents lose their jobs, uh, that you end up having worse outcomes. That is not what's driving this relationship. And one way that you can see that is if I repeat the same plot but restrict the sample to the set of kids whose own parents remained employed. And so just to be clear on how we're measuring this, we're measuring parental income while kids are growing up, say like while they're 10 years old, and then looking at whether they retain their jobs when kids are say 20 or 25 years old. So if you look at the set of kids whose parents remain employed, and again, look at the connection to area level or community level parental employment rates, it looks basically the same. So it's not about whether your own parents lost their job or not. There's a strong correlation with parental employment rates in your area for your race, for your class subgroup. So what I want to do next is ask, you know, why, why do we see this very strong correlation? It's clear that there's this correlation in the data. What is driving it? And I think it's useful to distinguish here between two different types of mechanisms. The first is what I'm going to call correlated shocks. So maybe the same shocks that are affecting parental employment, say uh, decline in labor demand, the local steel plant closes, something like that, also directly affects the children. So if children tend to go, go into the same occupations that their parents did, and they live in the same places, you know, if jobs have disappeared for the parents, maybe they've also disappeared for the children, and so you kind of get a mechanical link between those two things. A different possibility, which is more along the lines of what I think Bill Wilson had in mind, um, is that maybe the changes in parental employment are reflecting a change in environment more broadly, or perhaps causing a change in the environment more broadly in which kids are growing up, and that change in the childhood environment that children are growing up in in a place where employment has declined, and you know maybe the schools are different, maybe conditions are different more broadly, that that has a causal effect on kids' outcomes, even holding fixed what is going on with labor demand. So I want to distinguish between these two explanations. And the way that I'm going to do that is by studying kids who moved to improving versus declining areas at different ages. So the idea is very simple. Let me show you the logic by turning to this plot here. This is exactly the same kind of graph that I showed you before. Uh, changes in kids' outcomes across cohorts versus changes in parental employment rates in their county. But here I'm specifically focusing on a set of kids who moved to these counties where employment is changing 
before they were eight years old, so at a relatively young age, okay? And what you can see here is for these kids who showed up when they were relatively young in these counties, there's a strong relationship, very similar to what we saw in the original plot. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who made the same exact set of moves, but got there only when they were older, when they were teenagers. And what you can see is that the relationship becomes basically flat. So what this is telling you is if you showed up when you were 17 years old to a place where employment has been going down a lot, it doesn't seem to affect your outcomes at all. Where if you think about a labor demand story, right, that the steel plant closed and there are no jobs in this place, you would have thought the graph on the right should also show that same strong relationship. Clearly it doesn't. And so more generally, what we find, and we've developed this in further detail in the paper, if you look age by age, there's a very clear exposure or dosage effect. The earlier you get to a place where employment is increasing, if you are in a cohort that experiences more of an employment increase, you, you experience more of that as a child growing up for more years, you have better outcomes in adulthood. It is not consistent with the idea that just showing up in a place, you have different labor market prospects because the labor market itself has changed. So this, you know, I think strongly points in the direction of the environmental exposure effect rather than what I was calling correlated shocks. Now one further point, the conclusion that there's a causal effect here really relies on the premise that people who move to these improving areas when their kids were young are comparable to people who were moving to these areas when their kids were older. Behind the scenes, that's the key identification assumption here to be able to interpret these differences as a causal effect of environment. Given the amount of data we have, we can do a nice test of whether that assumption holds. You might worry that the types of families who move when their kids are young are different from the types of families who move when their kids are older. We can get at that by comparing siblings within the same family. And you can see that if you have siblings who have a relatively large age gap between them, the younger kid starts to do better than the older kid if you move to a place with increasing parental employment over time. But if those two siblings are much closer in age, they're not exposed to very different environments, and there's not much of a difference in their outcomes, as you see in the panel on the right, in relation to the changes in parental employment. So this kind of within-family comparison, I think, further supports the view that there really is a causal effect of childhood environment that's being captured by these parental employment rates that are changing over time on kids' long-term outcomes. One final piece of evidence that suggests that this is not really about changes in the labor market itself, but rather how children's choices and behaviors earlier, before they enter the labor market, that's what's really central, is if you look at various other outcomes, so for instance, the number of years of education that kids attain, do they drop out of high school, do they go to college, they exhibit the same kind of relationship with changes in parental employment rates. If you look at changes in SAT or ACT scores, for example, you get the same kind of picture. And so all of these pre-labor market variables also exhibit the same patterns, really suggesting that something is changing about what kids are doing, even in school, as a result of these upstream factors being captured by parental employment rates. So one final set of evidence now in trying to understand the mechanism through which parental employment rates and associated factors at the community level seem to be having a causal effect on kids' outcomes. So having established that there's that causal link through childhood exposure, I want to now think about the mechanism through which that's happening because I think that has important implications for how we might change opportunity going forward. And here, I once again want to distinguish between two different mechanisms. What I'm going to call a sociological class of mechanisms. So what do I have in mind here? Perhaps higher parental employment rates improve kids' outcomes through social interactions. So what, what, what's some intuitive logic here? Many people get jobs through job referrals in the United States. If you're living in an area where lots of your friends' parents are employed and more generally employment levels are high, maybe you're more likely to get a referral to a job that ends up putting you on a good career trajectory. More generally, and I think in some ways probably more importantly, uh, it could be about changes in aspirations. So if you grow up in a place where lots of people are employed and gone to college and are doing well and so on, you yourself are motivated to study. You feel like there's you know, potentially a payoff to that and you pursue a certain career path. If you've never met anyone who's gone to college and surrounded by people who are experiencing a lot of hardship, maybe that completely changes your mindset. 
So that's one set of explanations that have something to do with who you're interacting with, who you're inspired by, perhaps. A very different class of explanations is an economic set of explanations that higher parental employment rates, you know, of course, are associated with higher incomes in your community. If you have higher incomes, there's more funding for schools, there are perhaps more local programs that benefit kids. You know, maybe that's what's driving uh, the, the effects that we're seeing in the previous slides. So we're gonna test between these explanations by exploiting differences in friendship patterns across groups. So let me show you the idea by turning to this graph here. So first, I'm gonna to turn to a different data source that our team has been working with, which is Facebook data to measure connections across different types of people. And in this first graph here, I'm gonna show you what I think is a very intuitive result. I'm just plotting the share of friends that people have in high school in their own birth cohort versus one year younger, one year older, two years younger, two years older, and so on. And you can see, and it's probably obvious to you from introspection, uh, that um, if you, uh, you, you are much more likely to have friends in your own birth cohort than you are in a birth cohort that's one below or one above, two below, two above, et cetera. It just reflects the simple intuition that you're more likely to know the kids in your own grade than those one above you, one below you, and so on. Okay, so that's just a basic fact about the nature of social interaction. So now what I'm gonna do is an analysis where we relate your outcomes to parental employment rates of parents of kids in your own birth cohort versus one before, one after, and so on. And what you can see is that pattern very much mirrors, shown in the green here, the pattern of friendships that we see across cohorts. What matters much more for your outcomes are parental employment rates of other kids in your own birth cohort than kids who were one year younger, one year older, two years younger, two years older, and so on. You get this exact same sort of decay pattern, which is very consistent with the idea that interaction really is the key thing here. If it was about economic resources, we would expect you know, even a couple cohorts ahead, if there were more employed parents, the community is richer, you would think that that would benefit you in the same way. One last piece of evidence that I think points in this same direction. Suppose you ask how your uh, outcomes relate to parental employment rates of people in your own racial group versus the other racial group. So there's extensive prior evidence that there's a lot of racial homophily. People tend to interact more with people of their own racial background than other racial backgrounds. And so here what we're doing is taking the set of low-income white kids and relating their outcomes to the employment rates of low-income white adults. And you can see that there's a strong connection there with a coefficient of about 0.3, drawing that kind of graph that I showed you in the, in the previous slides. If you relate low-income white kids to the employment rates of low-income black parents, there's basically no connection at all. Now if you do the same ex exact exercise in the opposite direction, relate the outcomes of low-income black children to the employment rates of low-income black parents versus low-income white parents, you see the mirror image. It's the low-income black parents' employment rates that matter for low-income black kids' outcomes. But interestingly, you'll notice that that 0.07 coefficient turns out to be statistically significant. There's maybe a little bit of connection to low-income white parents' employment rates. So what is behind that? One final piece of evidence that I think is really sort of the exception that may prove the rule here if we now split that cell up into places where you have a lot of cross-race interaction as proxied for by rates of interracial marriage versus very little cross-race interaction, you can see that white parents' employment rates are starting to matter more for black kids' outcomes exactly in the places where you have higher rates of interracial marriage, which is another piece of evidence consistent with this idea that social interaction seems really clear, really critical here. So in the last couple of minutes, and I know we're up on time and I wanna to get to the discussion, let me just show you one uh, final piece of data and then, and then wrap up. So uh, we can also look more directly at whether social interaction seems you know, really important. And so in some work we've done with Matt Jackson and other collaborators, we've compared the map of upward mobility that I've shown you before here, just looking at it cross-sectionally for the 1980 cohort to measures of what we're calling economic connectedness based on the Facebook data where we're measuring the fraction of high-income friends that low-income people have county by county. 
The blue-green colors in the map on the right are places where on Facebook, low-income people are more connected to high-income people. And you can see those two maps are incredibly similar to each other. So we don't have this over time, but just as a cross-sectional fact, it is a very strong pattern that places with more cross-class interaction tend to be the places with more economic mobility. Another piece of evidence suggesting that the social interaction mechanism is really critical. So to summarize, so what do we learn from this new empirical evidence and what does it mean finally for increasing economic mobility going forward for changing opportunity? In canonical economic models, as many of you will know, economic immobility or the persistence of income across generations really arises from financial constraints and human capital investment. So this goes back to the ideas of Gary Becker and others, you know, why do kids from low income families tend to have poorer outcomes because lower income parents may not have the money to invest in their education, which limits their opportunities. But I think these data suggest that sociological factors may play an equally important role in shaping kids' outcomes. And so um, motivated by that, uh, Matt Jackson and I have been thinking about recently uh, a theory of economic mobility that's more of a sociological theory than an economic theory, where kids' outcomes are influenced by their peers uh, in the groups to which they belong. So for instance, the college that you attend or the neighborhood in which you grow up. And critically, your ability to access those groups is influenced not just by your own effort, but by parental income and the kinds of connections your parents have. So if your parents have more resources, you can buy your way into a better school district where you're more connected to peers who may end up you know, providing those positive influences that end up uh, influencing your outcomes. What's gonna happen in this model is that kids with lower income parents deliberately choose to invest less in education and human capital because the payoff to them seems lower. If you're not gonna get that job, even if you study hard because you don't have the connections, there's no point in investing in it. And what ends up happening in equilibrium is that income diverges across groups and you get segregation endogenously. And critically, poverty persists in this model across generations because of a lack of social rather than financial capital. And, but despite that fact, changes in the prior generation's employment or level of connections can change economic mobility relatively rapidly, thus kind of fitting the set of facts that I've, that I've shown you here. So let me conclude here with that theory in mind for what I think some of the potential implications are for increasing economic opportunity going forward, kind of the question that I started out with. First, I think there's likely to be a strong complementarity between investing in social capital and investing in financial and human capital, which is what I think economists have traditionally focused on. And that is in fact, and we can go into more detail on this in the discussion, I think that's very consistent with recent experimental evidence in various domains on the types of programs that are most effective in increasing economic mobility. Second, I think we really should focus on social communities within neighborhoods as the key unit of change not just neighborhoods as a whole. When we think about place-based policy in the US and elsewhere, usually people think about places as a whole, we should invest in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood. But here it really seems like the community that people are interacting with is the key unit of change. And finally, you know, looking at it from a forward-looking perspective, supporting the next generation in places that are declining, rather than just thinking about job training for the current set of folks who may have lost their jobs, may be a very useful approach to stem off further declines in mobility, for instance, for low-income white communities. The key open question that I've not answered here that may be on many of your minds and that I think we'll discuss further is what concrete interventions can increase mobility going forward? I don't have a specific answer for you on that dimension. To support further work and trying to figure that out, our team's gonna release new data on economic mobility by county, race, gender, class, and birth cohort, basically to see how these things are changing over time, those maps that I was showing you this spring. And just to give you a flavor, I'm gonna end on the slide, a flavor of what that data looks like. Let me go back to the example of Charlotte that I mentioned at the very beginning, ranks 50th out of 50 in terms of economic mobility in, in the study we did 10 years ago. Quite interestingly and encouragingly, you can see that Charlotte actually has exhibited tremendous progress over these 15 birth cohorts, where it's now become close to the average place in terms of upward mobility for black Americans. Showing, I think, 
that opportunity can indeed be changed in a time frame where all of us can make a difference. Thanks so much. Thank you, Raj. That was a great talk, as always. Uh, I'm going to get right to it. And what I want to focus on is what it would take to increase opportunity, equalize opportunity in the US. And this is, this, you know, obviously this is a country that purports to care deeply about equal opportunity, purports to care deeply about mobility, and yet we failed pretty, pretty spectacularly in, in delivering on that, on that commitment. And so I think it's uh, important to ask what this work that you've just presented uh, means for, for how we go forward, just as you concluded at the end. And you know, what I've always loved about your work is that that's been the question that's front and center for you. What do we need to do to, 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 to realize that commitment? Uh, so I wanna, I wanna talk about that. I have a bunch of questions about that. One question for every day of the week. This is the Monday question. <laughs> so I take your work, well, let me step back. Someone might take your work as thinking that the key takeaway is what we need to do is increase employment. If we increase employment, uh, we'll make headway in equalizing opportunity. That's kind of, that would be great in some ways because we have a lot of tools out there for increasing employment. The Federal Reserve Bank, that's one of their jobs is to, to maintain as, as high rates of employment as possible while, while keeping inflation stable. Uh, or we have the earned income tax credit, right? If you want to focus on increasing employment among the low-income population, the EITC is a wonderful tool at our disposal for doing so. And so here's my question. Is job one, based on the results that you, you've presented here, is job one to increase employment? Yeah, so th <clears throat> thanks very much, David. So um, certainly I could see how that could be a takeaway from the relationships I've presented, where there are these very strong connections with employment in the prior generation. But I want to be cautious on drawing that conclusion. That could well be right. But I don't think you can quite be certain from the evidence that I've presented, because we view really parental employment as a marker of changes in childhood environment. And we haven't directly shown that changing parental employment itself has a causal effect on kids' outcomes. So what we've seen is if kids grow up in environments where parental employment's increasing, they do better. But that doesn't necessarily mean that changing parental employment itself is the key driver. So what do I mean by that? To make that a little bit clearer, you can draw the same kind of graphs if you look at other measures of parent success. So for instance, measures of parent mortality or parent marriage rates. There are various other variables that turn out to correlate quite strongly with kids' outcomes. And so you know, I don't think it's certain yet that employment is the key factor. But let's pause it for a second that it is uh, you know, really important. I think even then, it's not totally obvious that a federal policy to increase employment along the lines of what you were suggesting, you know, to the extent it can be controlled by macroeconomic policy or changes in things like the Earned Income Tax Credit, that that will deliver changes at the community level that have the kinds of impacts that we're seeing here. So let me just give you an example that comes to mind here in Silicon Valley, you know, sitting here at Stanford, I participated in a group called the Gates Mobility Partnership, founded, uh, sponsored by the Gates Foundation with several other scholars over the past few years. And uh, what they did is took folks to various different communities to try to understand how people were experiencing economic mobility on the ground, to really get a, a real sense of what the problem is. And one thing I remember vividly, there was a visit done here in uh, the Bay Area to East San Jose. And we were talking with a, a group of families. And someone asked, you know, what's your experience living in Silicon Valley? Of course, a place with a lot of jobs, a lot of employment, right? And I was struck by the response of, of the woman to whom the question was asked. And she said, you know, what is Silicon Valley? And you know, it just shows you like, how detached these communities actually can be. And so it's not obvious to me that simply creating jobs without creating those connections that seem quite important uh, would necessarily be the answer. I'm going to push back. Okay. It's my job. Uh, Tuesday question. Uh, I want to probe a bit more about the extent to which what would come out of this, this, this set of results that were presented here would be 
truly place-based policy. Because you might argue that whatever it is, if it's employment or something associated with employment, that, that bucket of an amenities that, that might be correlated with employment, that employment proxies, whatever it is, you might say that we need evidence that it's not a matter of delivering it across the board to all neighborhoods, or maybe all low-income neighborhoods in, in, in the US, uh, because we don't have evidence that we should concentrate our resources on a small number of neighborhoods and ramp up their employment or some other amenity a lot and not focus across the board on all low-income communities. That is, in what sense do we have evidence for a place-based strategy as, as opposed to one that's dispersed across all, say, low-income neighborhoods? Yeah, so I mean, that's a very good question. So first, let me just say, part of the reason I focus on place is not because place is necessarily the only unit at which we should think about change. I think it's a very useful lens. You think of it like an analogy to a microscope. It's a useful way to understand the determinants. But it could well be that we can come up with national policies that end up having a significant impact, you know, perhaps by increasing employment, if that is indeed the key mechanism. Now, that said, I do think that there are likely to be significant differences across areas in the bang for the buck you get from different programs. So take a place that already has quite high levels of employment. On the margin, you would think that if you expand the EITC, to take your example, a lot of that spending there is going to be inframarginal. All of these people were working anyway. You're now giving them more money from the government. Uh, it's not clear you know, that that's going to translate to a change in a way that if you targeted efforts at places that have particularly low levels of employment using these kinds of newly available data, you know, maybe you increase effectiveness. So even if at root you know, one doesn't have to take a place-based approach, it could end up being the most cost-effective way to make progress. Great. Um, I'm persuaded. Uh, Wednesday question. I want to shift focus a bit, talk about discrimination and where that fits into this analysis. So it's possible that one of the reasons why we're seeing an increase in employment in some, in some neighborhoods is because of a reduction in discrimination. And indeed, that's a point that, that Raj references in, in an early working paper uh, that's associated with these results. Um, so in that sense, changes in discrimination might lurk behind the changes in employment that we're seeing and be a partial account of those changes. But it's also possible that reductions in discrimination don't just affect parental employment, but have a direct effect on, say, the aspirations of, of, of children. And you could imagine, say, if black children have less discriminatory interactions, uh, they're going to face fewer barriers to getting ahead. They're going to be more hopeful about the future. They're going to have higher aspirations, and that might translate, as Raj described in that, in that theory at the end of the talk, that those higher aspirations might then translate into, into higher human capital investments. So if that's the case, it, it underlines the importance of anti-discrimination uh, initiatives. I mean, we would care about those regardless, but this gives you further ammunition in saying that those are critical in, 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 in reducing uh, barriers to mobility. Uh, so if that's the case, it would, it would really be a... a uh, a powerful argument for ramping up our support for such initiatives. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Is that a plausible mechanism? Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely, David, in a way that connects back to the first question about whether this is really about employment. It could well be about other factors correlated with employment that are changing the environment that kids are growing up in, um, and that ends up affecting their outcomes. Kind of stepping back a bit, I guess my view is a plausible theory of what's going on, and this is what Matt and I are trying to capture in, in the model that I was describing, is that if you sort of feel like there's no payoff to, to working because at the end of the day, sorry, to, to investing, because at the end of the day, you're not going to get that job, either because of discriminatory practices or some other lack of you know, other factors that are limiting opportunity, or you're not going to get into a college because the kids who get into, as we show in some other work, kids who get into highly selective colleges tend to come from higher income families and you may not have as much of a shot. If you have that view, then you can see how, as a child, you might not invest so much in school. Like, what's the point? The payoff isn't there. Yeah. And so I certainly think you know, discrimination could be part of you know, the underlying mechanism that's driving some of the results that we're seeing. I would note that it, racial discrimination, at least as canonically, I think, conceptualized, is unlikely to explain all the patterns in the data, in particular what I showed for white Americans, right, where we're seeing a yeah. similar set of phenomena. And so the fact that there's sort of a common uh, underlying set of patterns across these groups suggests that there are 
other things going on as well, but discrimination could certainly be part of the puzzle for, for black Americans yeah. in particular. Okay. Question four, the Thursday question. I want to think more about what, what social capital actually is and what, what kind of work it's doing in, in uh, uh, delivering uh, mobility, if indeed that's the key intervening mechanism. So as I understand the model, you have uh, an increase in employment at the, at the community level. That then leads to uh, increased access to social capital of the sort that pays off for mobility. And hence, it's social capital. Under this formulation, it's social capital and access to social capital that's doing the work. And employment is just opening up that access. And so it has, has a, uh, a background effect, but, but not, a, not a direct effect. It's really, at the end of the day, all about social capital under the, the, mm -hmm. the crisp rendition of this, of, this, of this set of results. So if that were the case, you could say, well, I'm going to circumvent the monumental task of increasing employment and go right to the one, to the variable that's getting the work done, which is access to social capital, and think about interventions that, that target that. Uh, and maybe you get more bang for the buck by targeting that mechanism rather than operating through some background variable like, like employment or something correlated with employment. So there's lots of ways you might do that. One is, one is, say, mentoring initiatives. They might be seen as very fundamental to that sort of formulation. And in some sense, a mentoring initiative is saying, let's create a faux neighborhood around the, around the individual uh, that will deliver all those resources that, 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 that social capital can deliver. You might still get lots of very important stuff out of your real neighborhood, but the mentoring initiative delivers you some stuff that might help for getting, say, a job. So here's my question. What do you think about that type of initiative, one that goes right to the social capital mechanism rather than, than, than working sort of further on the left-hand side? Yeah. I mean, so I think you're right about if this is really the key mechanism, and I think the data are consistent with that being at least an important piece of the puzzle, it would be great if we can target it directly. I think when you look at the evidence on mentoring programs that have been attempted, there's mixed evidence on how effective they are. My interpretation of that from reading literature and some related work that we've done is that part of it has to do with how light touch most plausible mentoring programs are, that it's difficult to really embed yourself in the community and truly change someone's aspirations. It takes more than spending an hour with someone. I think one needs to really think thoughtfully about how you do that in an organic way. I think this is absolutely an area where it would be great to experiment further, and I think there are actually folks here in the audience from the Palo Alto High School who are trying an innovative program, for instance, on building uh, these, these kinds of connections. Um, I think it would be great to, to learn more about that. And my, my sense, stepping back a bit, is the reason it might be valuable in tandem to focus on things like increasing employment or whatever the root factors are in tandem, is at the end of the day, rather than sort of trying to teach someone what to do, like demonstrating that by your own example yeah. might be the most effective way to actually have an impact. I think as a parent, you see that you know, with, with children, and I think this may play out more broadly. Great. So we're on the Friday question, number 507. We're getting there. Um, and it's, it's another question about you know, what social capital is and what about social capital is doing the work. And I want to distinguish two possible accounts and see where you, where you come down on those. Uh, so the first account thinks of it in a pretty narrow way. And in particular, it thinks about social capital as, as job referrals. And I don't mean to be dismissive about that. They can be immensely important, right? Uh, and mainly what, what's doing the work here is that if you have access to social capital, you have access to job referrals. But there's also a more diffuse account, and it's one that I think at the end of your talk you, you might have leaned into, but, but I want to see if I'm right on that. And the more diffuse story is that uh, really what social capital is doing here is demonstrating that there's a payoff to human capital. You see around you people who've gotten that payoff. That's a strong demonstration effect. Uh, uh, and, and that's what's really doing the work. It's not narrow access to job referrals, it's that demonstration effect. Um, what do you think? How, is there anything in your results that adjudicate between that kind of narrow job referral account and the more diffuse human capital account? 
So I think the simplest piece of evidence on that, the most direct one in some ways, is the exposure effect that I showed. So if it was literally just about getting a job referral and point in time being able to access those job referrals, you would think it shouldn't matter if you showed up in a community when you're three or five or seven, presumably you're not getting job referrals. At that point, it's really only when you're entering the labor market. And so you wouldn't get that dosage effect. However, you could imagine job referrals still being part of the picture if they themselves change people's perception of the incentives to invest. So if I know down the road there's going to be a job waiting for me, and I've seen other people who you know, stay in school and work hard and do you know, various things, and that results in a job because of these strong job referrals, because of those connections, that may then end up affecting what children do and end up affecting aspirations and norms and so on. So I wouldn't want to completely rule out the importance of job referrals from this evidence, but I do think it has to operate through a more complex mechanism than literally you show up yeah. and now you have connections to, to different jobs. Yeah, it's kind of a strange type of complementarity in which you're forward looking on, on, on yes. the job referral. Interesting. Yes. Uh, okay, second to last question, the Saturday question. Um, and it's about aspirations, which featured strongly in that, in that model at the end. Uh, and you haven't talked much, you did a little bit at the end about cash and financial barriers and kind of, the, the, as you call it, the canonical uh, economic model in that regard. And I wonder if what you think about the opportunity enhancing approach of providing cash, like mm -hmm. say a baby bond. And for those of you who don't know baby bonds, the idea is that for those children who aren't born into high wealth families, you basically have the government stepping in to substitute and saying, you know, when you turn age 18, you're gonna get a bundle of wealth that will compensate for not having wealth given to you by virtue of the birth lottery, uh, and that would then in turn open up opportunities. Uh, opportunities like going to college, paying for tuition, opportunities like starting a business, all those opportunities that wealth affords are now available not just to high wealth kids, but to low wealth kids. So the question then is, what do you think about that kind of intervention, and how might it interact with, with the, the social capital that, it, yeah. that you discussed? So cash is undoubtedly important if people literally have no money to be able to finance basic needs for their kids, that's going to tremendously limit opportunity and, and progress. But the evidence I've seen is that there's a, a, it's not adequate. And so in various programs that we've studied, for instance, job training programs, I was alluding to some of these at the end, or housing voucher programs that basically seek to give fin families financial resources to move to better neighborhoods, we find that if you simply provide information and cash, families don't necessarily act upon that in a way that leads to improvements down the road. But if you further provide direct social assistance, so for instance, in the context of housing search, a counselor who helps you find a house in a higher opportunity neighborhood where your kids are more likely to succeed, or in the context of job training, not just giving you a set of technical skills, but connecting you to an employer who wants to hire for exactly that set of skills. Those kinds of interventions, experimentally we see, have much higher rates of return than a direct financial intervention. And so my instinct is, you know, I think this is sort of intuitive for the PhD students in the audience. I mean, if you think about what your advisor might provide for you, it's not just resources, but it's someone to emulate and an example to sort of follow. And my sense is that kind of connection matters quite a bit in many different domains. So that's the complementarity between social yes. and financial capital. Okay. Last question. It's a more personal one. Are you up to that? We'll see what it is. Okay. <laughs> well, so I'm a card-carrying sociologist. You're a card-carrying economist. Today's talk, titled The Sociological Foundations of Economic Mobility, suggests you made the wrong bet. <laughs> so. Here's my question, would you like to switch teams? Come to the winning <laughs> side. A bit of a rhetorical question. Here's the real question that lies behind that. There are people here who are thinking about what bet to make. And what would you say about the payoff? What, let me step back. What, would, what is the payoff to the economic approach to understanding economic mobility? You, you laid out the sociological case. 
Is there a residual there? I want to salvage your reputation among, <laughs> among economists. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I would say what clearly economics has gotten right and is central here is obviously incentives matter quite a bit, which has been a core focus of economics. And I think one of the things that emerges from the kind of model Matt and I are working on, and I think more generally, is economics and the framework that's been developed over many decades in economics of competitive equilibrium and thinking about when markets function well has delivered, I think, tremendous growth in certain contexts, a lot of progress overall. I think the issue that remains to be addressed and has not, in my view, fully successfully been addressed are issues of inequality and inequality and opportunity in particular. And I think there's no guarantee that the free market capitalistic economy that can produce a lot of growth is going to create inclusion in terms of opportunity. Lots of people can basically be left behind in that, that sort of system. Uh, and so that's where I think thinking between these fields, both from a topical perspective, the way that I just described in this talk, also from a methodological perspective, where in economics I think a lot of progress has been made on the quantitative side, methods of causal inference and so on that can really help us understand these questions. I think in complement sociological uh, approaches as well, methodologically. Um, you know, my view at the end of the day is prefer not to be on any particular team and answer to your question, really get to the, you know, what's driving these issues. And in a way, I think that actually nicely ties back to this being the Arrow Lecture. What I find inspiring about Ken Arrow's work is that it was very much of that interdisciplinary nature that there, it's reflected in the fact that there are Arrow Lectures in many different fields. And I think that's uh, exactly the theme. But Thank you. <laughs> Even God rested on the seventh day. But we're going to ask <laughs> Professor Chetty to work well into next week by inviting audience members now to pose questions. You'll see there's microphones on each side of the auditorium. Could we ask you to line up at the mics if you have a question? And as people are getting over to the microphones, um, I'm going to expect there's going to be a lot of questions. So for the sake of opportunity, um, could you please ask a single question and attempt to be concise? Thanks very much. We'll start over here. Thank you for, for the talk. I have a question on what you actually call a social community. Uh, part of it, you know, is related to, you know, parents and neighborhoods. Uh, so, for example, if I go to a charter school, which is in another mm -hmm. neighborhood, etc., so who are the relevant people that actually I should have interactions with? Are the people in my new school, the neighborhood? Is it? So could you say a little bit more about yeah. that? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. So mechanically, in the, what I was showing you in this talk, just in terms of what we're able to measure in the census tax data we're using, we're defining what I call the social community by area, by race, by class. Okay, so that's just turns out to be at that level, we see a lot of variation in outcomes. And, things correlate with outcomes for that definition of a group. But as you note, there's nothing you know, written that your community depends upon exactly where you live or your racial identity or your, your class or anything like that. Um, and this is where I think things like the Facebook data that we've been using in other work can be quite valuable to understand what the nature of interactions looks like. Um, so we find, for example, in our earlier papers with Matt and others that uh, the, the types of connections that people make vary a lot depending upon the setting they're in. So you gave the example of charter schools, you know, a school in a different neighborhood. You hear sometimes anecdotes which are borne out in the data that if you are bused or you go to a very different school from where you come from, those kids sometimes end up being isolated from the rest of that community. But that doesn't always happen. We find in the data, for example, that smaller groups smaller schools tend to foster more connections across class lines. And so the community becomes broader in those settings. So I think one thing that would be very interesting to understand is exactly what determines a person's social community. And can that itself be changed to some of David's questions earlier as a way to 
potentially create more mobility. Bob, go ahead. Angus Deaton and, and, and Ann Case have emphasized opioid yeah. addiction as a source of poverty for white Americans. Yeah. You haven't mentioned that. I, I'd be interested in your commentary on their work on opioid addiction yeah. and poverty. Yeah, thanks very Thank much for, for raising that. So um, we've looked at, as you can imagine, you know, the correlation between the changes we're seeing and the opiate epidemic using the kinds of data that Angus and Ann have used. Uh, our sense is that may be a small piece of what's going on in explaining these broader trends, but it's not the key factor in and of itself. So my view of it is that it's a symptom of some of the kinds of issues that I've been raising here. One that certainly can have you know, deleterious downstream effects, but it does not single-handedly account for the broad set of trends that we're seeing. Uh, my question is, um, how do you think automation and jobs getting so technical um, impact kids? As someone who grew up on the internet and who has formed so many new connections on the internet, um, I think we could leverage uh, the internet more so that kids can move up, um, you know, have connections uh, yeah. with newer social circles. How do you think um, any, any interesting things or experiments you are seeing in this uh, direction? Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So yeah, I mean, of course, a very relevant question with all the focus on AI and technological change these days. And I think, you know, my, my view there is that technology can, it depends upon how we wield technology going forward. So on the one hand, you could have an amplification of all the trends that I've been showing you here, where there's more displacement from jobs, certain people get more disconnected from the labor market, and there's kind of an amplification of these trends. On the other hand, as you're, notice, as you're noting, I think if we use technology in the right way, there are possible ways, you know, perhaps there are ways of connecting people very differently or using AI. There's some nice recent experimental evidence showing that uh, when you give people AI tools, they're able to increase their productivity if they have low levels of productivity to begin with. So that may actually help level the playing field in certain contexts, but I think it's all about how one interacts with the technology and changes institutions and deploys that technology. I don't think it's automatic that that's going to happen. So taking a very deliberate approach in that context with an eye towards these kinds of mechanisms would be quite valuable, I think. So you focused a lot on the local conditions of employment in terms of a factor for mm -hmm. social mobility, but my question would be more, what about education? There are wide disparities between school districts in, yep. in the US, some yeah. high performance one and some yeah. really problematic. Yep. And so my question would be, um, what about uh, working on, on that problem? Yes. You know, uh, would that provide even more leverage than uh, local uh, yeah. employment conditions to improve mobility? Yeah, great question. You know, certainly I think directly changing education and other aspects of environment can be extremely important. There's good evidence that certain types of charter schools, for example, or changes in the size of classes, the quality of teachers, all the inputs into the education production function can really have quite significant long-term impacts. So I want to be clear that you know, in the talk that I gave today, I'm not dismissing any of that by any means. A lot of our own team's prior work emphasizes the impacts of those more traditional resource-based interventions. What we are seeing, though, is insofar as there have been significant changes in mobility over the past 15 years, my instinct, based on the evidence that I've shown you, is that that did not occur because of fundamental changes in the quality of education in these places, in these communities, over that 15-year horizon. In this time period, the changes seem to have occurred because of different mechanisms, the ones that we've been discussing here that relate to interaction, perhaps, or who people are connected to, et cetera. But that does not, to be clear, and I'm glad you asked this question, does not by any means mean that education doesn't play a role, that we shouldn't be trying to improve the quality of education in under-resourced districts and so on. I think both of those things are true. Hi. Uh, building upon the previous question, uh, I noticed you cited Peter Bergman's work with great schools. Uh, and I'd just be curious to, know, to learn what you think the sort of promising opportunities are for these informational interventions, particularly combining with the type of administrative data you work with. Yeah. So um, 
Yeah, I'll answer that question in two parts. So, you know, the study you're referring to, Bergman et al., is actually a different Bergman et al. than the one that I oh. was citing there, the hazards of the et al., I guess. But um, uh, in, in the paper on great schools, what Peter is showing is that providing information to people about the quality of schools in an area may enable them to make different choices. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think he would agree, and we found in other contexts, that those informational effects are modest in magnitude. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do them, because they're super low cost, so the rate of return is incredibly high. But in another Bergman et al. paper, which is actually one that I've worked with him on, which is an experiment in Seattle on helping families move to different neighborhoods, we find that an informational intervention has modest effects, but what has really large effects is connecting someone with what you might think of as a broker or a counselor, what I was referring to earlier, someone who basically helps you navigate the housing search process and points out, you know, this is a high opportunity neighborhood that you could move to that's accessible given where your job is, that may be a place that you're actually interested in, I'm gonna come negotiate with the landlord to help make this happen. And we find that that dramatically increases the set of families who move to high opportunity areas and they continue to live there and it seems like their kids will have much better outcomes much larger than an informational intervention. The costs are much higher, but I think that is also something that we should really keep in mind in our toolkit. Um, this is gonna be a less fundamental question than the ones that have been asked, but um, you, you focus completely on black-white mm -hmm. differentials, and uh, I wonder what the situation might be with uh, Hispanics. Yeah. Yeah. Have you any notion? Yeah, absolutely. So let me say a little bit more on that. And I only, I didn't show that data only because of time constraints, but all of that's in the paper. And when we put out this data publicly, you will see uh, information on how things are changing for Hispanic Americans as well. So a couple of things. First, let me start by talking about the levels. So as you saw, that even at the end of the period that I was showing you, mm -hmm. black Americans have much lower levels of upward mobility than white Americans. Hispanic Americans, it turns out, even at the beginning in the 1978 birth cohort, have much higher levels of upward mobility than black Americans. They're about two thirds of the way between black and white Americans to begin with. That has not changed significantly over time for Hispanic communities, but because they're at much higher levels to begin with, intergenerational progress for Hispanic Americans in terms of average incomes or health outcomes, a variety of different things, look dramatically better than they do uh, for, for black Americans. And so I think um, you know, there are very important differences there. Part of the reason I didn't focus on that here is because when you think about changes over time, you really see those for the black and white populations. Um, so you mentioned Facebook friends, and I'm curious whether you see also a role for uh, the physical built environment yeah. in neighborhoods in enabling the creation of social capital, and in particular what is called often public or civic places, uh, libraries, uh, yeah. pa uh, public parks, uh, arts and museum, uh, museums. And if you think that is part of place-based policy, who should be paid for those civic public places? Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. So I've actually connected in light of that work with a number of people in urban planning and design who are interested in these issues. And I absolutely think that the physical built environment can matter a lot in determining who people interact with. To take a very simple, you know, almost obvious example, uh, which we describe in our Facebook the, the papers in, in Nature, um, there was a school in Dallas, a very big public high school, where they had separate cafeterias, it turns out, where they served free and reduced price lunch and where they had their regular meals. Now, obviously, that's you know, a physical structure that's going to create a lot of disconnection across class lines. They hired an architectural firm to completely redesign things, and they argue that this you know, may have had quite a significant effect on how people are interacting. More in the context of urban planning more generally, you, know, you can think about how the level of segregation in cities might be a function of the structure of public transit, the availability of mixed income housing, and so on. And I think all of these factors matter. But one thing I would note and what we show in, in our paper is that while that physical environment, which is all about exposure and segregation, is an important piece of what drives the social disconnection between low and high income Americans, it turns out to be only half of the picture. 
The other half is what we term friending bias, the idea that even if you and I are in the same room, we tend to interact much more with people like us than people who look different from us. And that may be coming from various other factors about common interests and so on. But the key point is that I think this kind of physical infrastructure can be a big piece of what's going on. But the friending bias piece is also equally important. So if you think about a college campus like this, you know, thinking about who's admitted to a place like Stanford, that's the diversity exposure issue. And there's, of course, a lot of attention paid to that. I think much less attention is paid to how do we actually ensure that the lower income kids on campus who are admitted are, in fact, interacting with the higher income kids, because that really seems to matter. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. I have a question about social capital, but more particularly the scale and reach of social capital. So when is it actually useful for someone to be surrounded by other people? And you talked about the importance of having someone to emulate or in more traditional personal connections, getting job referrals or mm -hmm. such. Um, but then you also talked about how we can see upward economic mobility if we move to areas um, that have better, for example, parental employment early enough. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, social capital will presumably lead to better economic upward mobility. However, I was wondering, what do you think is the scale on that social capital? Are it, is it the personal connection that matters the most? Um, you talked about mentorship. Or is it more broad? If, does an observational quality also help? Yeah, it's yeah. an excellent question. You know, I'm, to be frank, I think we don't have an empirical answer yet. I think both of the hypotheses you describe are plausible, that if you're directly connected to someone, it makes a difference in your life. And more broadly, if you see people around you doing well, even if you're not directly connected to them, that has an impact. In fact, we're doing some research at the moment where we're trying to understand using the Facebook data, which of these mechanisms are, are more important. So rather than trying to speculate, I'll maybe have something to say about that uh, in, a, in a couple of years when we make further progress with the data. Thank you very much for uh, the attempt also to bridge the disciplines of sociology and economics. It sort of reminds me that Harvard economics was actually the home of both sociology and econ uh, 100 years ago. So you're sort of carrying forward that tradition now. My question is about the US place in the world. So much of your talk is focusing on America yes. as a country and the mobility within yes. that country. Uh, and obviously, you know, there's a, it's one of the richest countries on this planet. Uh, we have economic globalization. We know that there is an effect of those with the Rust Belts and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I'm wondering in general today, how would you perceive what we're seeing in terms of the upward mobility? How much would that be? explained perhaps by events outside of the US, uh, maybe focusing on, say, migration as one particular example. Um, economic globalization is an obvious driver. Um, but I would say country, uh, cities like San Francisco, LA, Boston, New York are, even if they are in American soil, uh, they're very much a sort of a global city. So how would you explain what we're seeing in terms of what we're seeing in the data here from a global perspective. Yeah, so I think your question touches on a number of different uh, important issues. You know, let me start by taking the point about immigrants, and here I would refer you to the work of your colleague here at Stanford, Rane Bramitsky, with Leah Bustan, who have, I think, done some of the most innovative work thinking about the mobility experiences of immigrants. And uh, to summarize briefly what, what they show in a series of influential papers, uh, immigrants tend to have very high rates of upward mobility, both historically and at present in the United States. And part of the reason for that, they argue, in conjunction with some of these data that I've been showing you here, is that immigrants tend to gravitate to places that offer high levels of upward mobility. Um, whether by choice or because that's where their networks are, that's what, that's what ends up happening. And so I think uh, the US does end up offering you know, an American dream for many immigrants, like myself, my own parents came to this country in search of the American dream, like countless others. And I think many people do really find those opportunities. But I, what I find striking about the United States is, despite the fact that it's one of the richest countries in the world, um, you still have many groups in the United States who don't have access to those opportunities, which I think is all the more remarkable and something that really hopefully one can address in this society that has a lot of resources. On a more global scale, 
one of the nice things that's, uh, that, that I've seen in recent years is people have started to replicate and further develop the type of work I showed you here in many other countries now, Scandinavian countries where you have similar data and in less developed economies. And I think these issues, as your question kind of suggests, are even more important in those contexts where you have even bigger disparities and opportunity in African countries and in India and so on. And I think a lot of the same mechanisms might be at play, but the stakes are even bigger. And so I think it's very important to study, study these issues in a global context. Thank you. Um, so talking about time horizons, you started the presentation showing how maps of um, economic mobility, place-based map really clearly onto um, other, uh, you know, historical uh, marginalization, mm -hmm. uh, like redlining and slavery. Um, and then the focus of the presentation is looking at the differences in economic mobility from a 1978 birth yeah. cohort to a 1992 birth cohort, yeah. which is a relatively short time frame yeah. relative to the 1850s when you started the presentation. Yeah. So I was curious about um, how you speak to the magnitude of what we're observing relative to the broader history um, and then maybe related what the changes in mobility you do observe actually mean maybe outside of income? Like are these, yeah. are these real changes in people's life, yeah. welfare, stability, yeah. ability to meet their needs yeah. outside of income? Thank yeah. you. Thanks, yeah, great question. So first, you know, as you know, I'm taking, I've started from this very broad historical lens, showed, you know, I think the roots of some of these issues are deep in history, but then I look at a very narrow time window. Part of that is driven just by data limitations that we can't go further back. But I, in a way, I think it's kind of interesting that even over 15 years, you can see some quite significant changes. A one-third change in these gaps is you know, not a small thing. Um, and so I view that as, as useful in its own right. Now, to address that limitation going forward, we're actually working with David and others on a project that seeks to digitize historical census and tax data and create a linked data set of the type that can be used to construct these maps that I've been showing you for the past 80 years, going back to the 1940, uh, going back to the 1940s. Um, and so that will allow this sort of analysis on a much broader time scale and kind of connect those earlier historical factors to this. And so we will see what emerges from that uh, in, in the coming years. Um, to your, and can you just remind me your second Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. And so to, to, to your second point on you know, how significant are, the, are these changes. So in a statistical sense, it's definitely not noise because you have data on the entire population. So standard errors would, be, uh, would not show up on those plots. But uh, in, in a broader sense, you know, the way I interpret your question is, is this really meaningful? Like, is this something that is a fundamental change in the trend? And I think what I would point to, and I didn't show you this again because of uh, time constraints, if you look at a variety of other outcomes that I think people would view as quite important, so mortality rates, for example, or um, you know, broader, other broad measures of educational attainment and so on, they all exhibit very much the same patterns. And so that you know, really seems like in terms of health and well-being, there are fundamental changes happening. Uh, and so my sense is this is not just kind of a blip. These are more sustained changes, and we'll see how they evolve over time. And there's no guarantee that this progress will be maintained. But I don't think it sort of so happens to have changed income a little bit for some people. It's much more systemic than that. Final question. No? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, Professor Chetty. Thank you for the uh, talk and all the answers you've given so far. My question is back to the social capital um, question and the different dimensions and forms that it takes. You've talked about direct access and the latent exposure to aspiration and resources. I'm curious whether you're considering other dimensions such as the social network structure itself, uh, yeah. the, in a given neighborhood network, the yeah. types of tie density, competition, yep. and solidarity, all factors that could also have been yep. affected by the drop in employment, yeah. um, and how you're considering or testing possibly yeah. these hypotheses. Yeah, yeah. So in the earlier cross-sectional work, I showed you the Facebook map and the map of mobility. We also construct many other measures of network structure, so 
uh, measures of clustering or essentially the number of triangles in networks, uh, other, uh, you know, the extent to which people are volunteering, other notions of social capital that people have thought about in the prior literature. And a striking result that emerged from that analysis is that there's really only one measure of social capital that strongly correlates with mobility, and it's that cross-class interaction economic mobility measure. The other measures, it just turns out, it's a clear statistical pattern in the data, do not correlate significantly with economic mobility. Now, that's not to say they're not important. They could well be important for other outcomes, and I think a very interesting line of research going forward could be to understand which types of social capital matter for which types of outcomes. But for this particular set of outcomes that we've been talking about here, economic opportunity, it really emerges quite strongly from the data that this cross-class interaction uh, aspect of social capital seems to be crucial. And that, I think, lines up with the other evidence that I've presented today, that parental employment and who you're connected to really seems to be a way to influence economic opportunity going forward. You're all warmly invited to join in the reception, which is directly outside. Thanks to the GSB for the facilities and the economics department. But thanks most of all, <laughs> Professors Chetty and Gresky for the evening.